Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar today, uh, Starting to Homeschool the Teenage Years with Pat Ferenga. I am Rochelle Hudson with the Learning Revolution Project, uh, overseen by Steve Hargadon. So today you'll be hearing the fifth of a series of six webinars about Starting to Homeschool with Pat Ferenga. Pat is a homeschooling dad, as well as the author and speaker about homeschooling, unschooling, and the work of John Holt. Pat's published Grown Without Schooling, the magazine, from Holt's death in, eight, in 1986 until 2001. He continues to speak and write about how we learn using standard school techniques, as well as how a civil society can be better enhanced by non-compulsory learning. So Pat, thank you so much for being here with us today. And whenever you're ready, take it away. Well, thank you, Rochelle. Um, Today, I, I want to talk about um, the teenage years because most homeschooling takes place between K through 8. Um, all sorts of statistics show that. However, every year, a little more teenagers do it. It's been slow growth on teen homeschooling, but it has been steady. And um, one of the things that, that I felt when I first got started uh, at Holt Associates in 1981 uh, I remember, you know, discussing this with John Holt was, well, how are homeschool kids going to get into college? And John was quite confident that they would and they could. But most importantly, even then he was saying, but why would they want to <laughs> if they've been homeschooled? You know, if they could see other ways of getting, learn, of doing, uh, of learning what they need to learn and to do things that, that they want to do. Why would they choose college unless it was necessary for them to do something? And that kind of got me because I was of the opinion, and I, I guess most people my age at that time, 21, 22, were, that you just went to college if, if you could afford it or if you, you know, I mean, that's what you did. I mean, we just don't question it, you know. I mean, you got in order to get a quote, unquote, good job, you got to go to college. That's how I was raised, and that, that's what I believed. But in 1981, John Holt started to, to – it was challenging uh, college way before that. In 1976, he wrote a book called Instead of Education, Ways to Help People Do Things Better. And even then he was, was challenging, you know, the idea that everyone must go to college. You know, he said, certainly, you know, it has its place and, you know, people, you know, it's great to study and, and, and to learn more about your life and have a, um, a philosophical outlook on life and so on and hopefully uh, college will broaden your horizons to do that. But John saw that it was just becoming another elite exercise in separating the wheat from the chaff and the winners from the losers in society. Um, and you know, the sorting machine, as he often called um, school, uh, was personified for him most strongly at the college level. He always felt that, you know, oh, home, you know, if colleges don't change, doesn't matter how much schools and high schools change, they're going to do whatever it is the colleges want to get them in. And we're seeing that. But um, I wanted to, I start with that because most people do homeschool through eighth grade and then you know, either send their kids to high school because they're worried about them getting into college if they continue to homeschool. Or if they're homeschooling, they often turn their homeschool into a more school-like environment to get serious, to make it you know, more like school. Well, I'm here to tell you that homeschoolers get into college without any difficulty. And secondly, success in adulthood without college degrees is perfectly possible. Um, you know, it's really not a problem to get into college for homeschoolers. And John was right. It, it really hasn't been for some time. Um, for instance, this is from Time Magazine. I believe this was like 2003 uh, from home to Harvard. This one is from Bostonia. This is the uh, uh, alumni magazine for Boston University. They did a cover story, I think this was in uh, 2010, 2011, about how homeschoolers handle BU. And um, this is the Journal of College Admissions, the fall 2004 issue. Um, the reason I, I put the website and address up is because you can get a, a copy of this. And in fact, I believe um, if you go to www.ahem.org, that's the Alternatives for Home Education in Massachusetts website, I believe they received permission to put this whole issue up online. And so you could read a PDF. I don't think you can download it, but you could read the PDF online there too. 
Um, and this, the whole issue is devoted to how homeschoolers get into college. And again, no, no difficulties. And it's, it's really been, been remarkable um, how well homeschoolers have done in college, um, given that they, they haven't been preparing to go to college since kindergarten, like so many uh, other students do. Now, having said that, you know, I don't want you to think that the main reason you should homeschool your child is to go to Harvard or an Ivy League school and, and so on. I mean, if that's what you want, if that's your goal, if your child wants to be a doctor, that you know, they got to go to medical school, you know, I, I get it. But there are different me types of medical schools, too, um, depending on, on how you, you like to learn, which I'm going to discuss in a little bit. But I do want to emphasize that success in our society is pretty well determined by college and the standard stories. And homeschoolers have been saying for years that getting into college isn't like the only means of success. And my friend Linda Dobson wrote this book, Homeschooler Success Stories. And I noted that on the cover, like you know, she had to have an Olympian, uh, a naval officer, um, a doctor, um, you know, a, a geography bee winner, you know, the standard signs of success in our society. And when I asked Linda, like, you know, one of the most dramatic stories in this book is about a girl who was abused um, at home and had a horrible experience in school, or might as well be considered abuse by the teachers in her school, but she found um, relief uh, by, by working um, for a caterer, and eventually she started a, a wildly successful catering business, which is how her uh, success story ends. And when I asked Linda, why she wasn't featured in the back cover or the front cover of the book. Uh, Linda said that she tried to get those people and their stories out there, but all of the um, marketing people insisted that they had to use these conventional you know, symbols of success. So we tend to think this way because the media forces us to, I mean, to say that, that this is success. But look, here are some people who were successful who did not have a lot of uh, a, a lot of school. Uh, top left here, this is out, uh, Thomas Alva Edison, George Bernard Shaw, uh, more into the 20th century. General George S. Patton was homeschooled, um, largely due to health reasons. Um, obviously, people saying that you're going to stay at home with your mom. Oh, uh, wrong one. You're going to stay at home with your mom and be homeschooled. You're going to be a wimp. Well, tell that to George S. Patton. Or better yet, tell it to Ernest Hemingway, or who didn't go to college. <laughs> or tell it to Louis Lemoore, one of the, this gentleman here, one of the best-selling writers of all time. So uh, pretty much put the Western, uh, define the Western, the novel about the American West. Alexander Graham Bell, Florence Nightingale here. And then this is Gloria Steinem. She was homeschooled. And uh, she writes about it, although she's not a big fan of homeschooling. Uh, like a lot of people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, uh, they say, oh, I didn't go to college, but I'm exceptional. <laughs> That's why it worked for me. Um, unschooling, homeschooling will work for anybody if you put your mind to it and you get comfortable with it. And it may only work for six months or for the rest of your life, but you know, at least it's a break from, the, from school if you need it. So, you know, these were all people who didn't follow the conventional patterns of success, you know, by going to college, getting the degree, and getting a house in the suburbs. But they did very, very well, and they've helped society grow. Now, Grace Llewellyn is, to me, like your one-stop author for information about homeschooling and unschooling teenagers. Um, she, her first book, The Teenage Liberation Handbook, is largely um, taken from the pages of Growing Without Schooling magazine. Um, and, you know, she just was able to take all these stories that we had generated from 1977 to 1998 about all the kids that were getting into college or finding really exciting work without going to college. And that book, The Teenage Liberation Handbook, if you or your child are thinking about leaving school or just want to know what would happen if I did, that is a great, a great book to start with. And if you're, you're, you're trying to think, uh, if your child isn't quite a teenager yet, oh, if your child isn't quite a teenager yet, but uh, you're still interested in these ideas, I recommend Guerrilla Learning. 
Um, it's not specifically about teenagers. It touches a little on it, but it's more more aimed at the K through eight thing and um, you know less homeschool specific. But um, these three books, um, particularly Real Lives and Teen Lib, deal directly with not going to high school, what you can do, how you do it, and also going to college and getting into college if you want. Um, this book here about Freedom Challenge African American homeschoolers is fantastic. And some of the stories do touch on getting into college, which, which I, I point out. By the way, um, on my handouts that, that accompany this, uh, webinar. There is a bunch of books uh, uh, that I'm not going to mention, as well as uh, resources and opportunities for teenagers. So do do be sure to look at the handouts, uh, websites, and travel opportunities. Um, you know, and, and and the reason I mentioned Freedom Challenge reminded me of that is there's a book um, that I list there by uh, I think the last name is Penn Naysbritt about um, how they uh, homeschool their African American children. And got them into all into Ivy League colleges. So if you're looking for for that sort of story and encouragement, there it is. It, it does exist. So, and um, as I said, homeschooling works for all sorts of families, not only exceptional individuals who are highly motivated. Now, why would you want to homeschool through high school? Well, a lot of kids, you know, you know. Parents are worried about sex, drugs, and rock and roll when it comes to high school. But what the top three pressures are, according to a poll in 1999, were to get good grades, get into college, and fit in socially. Those are the pressures that are really driving kids. And here it is, 2013, this next article in the Telegraph in Britain, uh, they're saying that the pressure on students to, um, to do well um, in schools is is that is increasing so much that um, psychologists are warning that that things that is becoming a, a major problem. Why are we doing this to our kids? Why are we doing this to ourselves? Why are we making school the be all and end all of, of our children's lives? You know, well, it doesn't have to be, and and you could take the pressure off by working and unschooling, uh, homeschooling if you want. Um, I'm going to talk more at this point about um, unschooling in the sense of talking with your child as much as possible to find out what they want to do. And, and because you have time on your side, school doesn't end at, start at 7 and end at 2.45. You know, it doesn't stop on weekends. It doesn't stop in the summer. Learning all the time is what we're talking about. And so by having a good relationship with your son and daughter, by understanding what it is they want to do as teenagers, you know, you can help them. If their goal is to get into college, okay. But you don't have to be on a four-year schedule heading towards college. That is, you know, that is what schools expect. And, you know, and, and you don't have to follow that in school. You, they may wind up in college, and, we, and, uh, and I'll talk about that. But let me give you um, a couple of examples. First of all, about relationships. Uh, I heard of, of, a, of a neat idea a couple of years ago in the homeschoolers where they had, um, we've often had book clubs, of course, where moms and dads get together to read books together, or moms and children, or homeschoolers book clubs where, like my friend Maureen Carey runs one where they'll take a, a like the Iliad and the Odyssey, and they'll read it out loud together and discuss it. Have, you know, the children, um, the young adults, and so on, being led through the, the book by Maureen. But um, you can also have mother-son book clubs, you know, mother-daughter, father-daughter book clubs. You know, you can, you can break it up because, you know, we're here during the day, and there's usually a parent around during the day, so we can, we can do these things. And, that, and that's pretty cool. And then what about goals? Well, let's talk about that. Let me tell you a story about um, a homeschooler, an unschooler I know in Ohio. He's now a grown-up. His name is Andy Ensley. And Andy, hated, you know, really was bored with school, and he couldn't wait till um, his, his parents agreed to homeschool him because he wanted to work at Fort Meigs, I think it was called. And um, this was a Civil War site, and Andy loved the Civil War. He was a Civil War reenactor. And so when he came out of uh, high school, his parents said, okay, what do you want to do? And he was honest. He said, I want to work at Fort Meigs. I want to do everything with the Civil War. I want to get completely into Civil War reenacting. Well, his parents, he said, fine. You know, 
and by the way, Andy did also help out in his father's business, you know, but not during school hours and stuff. But, you know, there, you know it wasn't just like, oh, willy nilly, just do whatever you want. He had other responsibilities around the house, too. But they said they, they realized that, you know, he was intelligent. He didn't like school. School wasn't working for him. So let's see what happens. So he goes to Fort Meigs. He knows so much about it in the Civil War that he winds up becoming a tour guide. And, and to his great satisfaction, he talked about giving tours to kids from his local high school. <laughs> he was their tour guide. And um, that information and knowledge, um, you know, le led to him being, um, well, he, he, there was a movie called, there were a bunch of Civil War movies being made at the time. One of them was Glory, which actually won some Academy Awards. And they were looking for historic reenactors who were young because their research showed that many of the Civil War fighters on the Union side were very young. And, you know, most of the young kids, of course, were in school. But there's Andy, you know, this, you know, young 16 or uh, 15 or 16 year old Civil War reenactor. And his director caught his eye or the casting director. And um, they started, you know, they asked him, you know, because he was part of the Civil War reenacting troupe that was being used as extras in the movie Mercy. Um, you know, he was on the scene a lot, and he started offering some hints to uh, the people who were doing it, saying, you know, that's not the way that they, they wore their swords in this unit, and that's not, you know, the proper insignia for that Confederate soldier and so on. And they were so impressed with him that they recommended him to be a technical director, a technical advisor to a movie, uh, another Civil War movie that was being made for TV. I think it's called Miracle in the Wilderness with um, Chris Christopherson. And then that led to yet another technical director, but also, um, you know, extra role for him and his sister, who now has left high school because Kira saw how much you know, fun Andy was doing. She wanted to be an actress. And through Andy's connections, he got them, uh, they, they both wound up as, as Civil War extras in the movie Dancing with Wolves. And now Andy is completely set up to go to a Hollywood, which he does. And... Um, to make a long story short, he became a set dresser um, in Hollywood. And then I forget exactly how this story goes at this point, but after he worked in Hollywood for many years, he then became a policeman. So it's funny. You don't know where these things are going to go, you know, but the relationships and working on their goals with their his parents led him to some incredible, fruitful, and, you know, and, and, and interesting experiences. Um, and all without a college degree, you know, um, I could tell you other stories, but we have a lot to go through, but, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to tell more about this. So working with your kids, always asking them and they may change just like the, you know, your, 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 your first grader says they want to be a fireman. Then when they're halfway through the year, they say that they want to be president and the, you know, it's okay. They, this is, youth is a time when people should be trying on these different roles. You know, um, it's, it's perfectly okay. And, um, you know, another thing that you, you want to discuss with your, you know, when you talk about goals are um, what is it that you want to do? Do you want to go to college? Because if you do eventually want to go to college, you should start keeping some records, you know, of this. And you can do an after-the-fact curriculum, and you, you can successfully do that. Um, but it's easier even for your own records, you know, um, to, to just keep documents of like, if you, if your son or daughter is participating in a civil war reenacting troop, document that. Um, if they're in a community theater group, if they're taking community college courses, if they're taking any sort of, um, course or doing any sort of work, just, just make a note of that, you know, take a photo of them at work to prove it. Um, just stuff that, that will help you, define um, what your, your, your son or daughter has done during their teenage years should they decide to go to college. Um, but don't get hung up on courses and stuff. You matter. You matter far more than schools and educators want you to believe. They want you to believe that's the quality of the teacher, the quality of the materials. But you know, it doesn't matter if your kids are going to engage in, in risky behavior, join fraternities, and do stupid things to other children, uh, other other adults. You know, the best connection for teenagers' health and the strongest barrier to high risk behaviors is for a teenager to have a strong emotional connection to 
a parent. This is why relationships are important. You know, you can always hire teachers, you know, but it's, it's you know, and, and yeah, you can hire and spend a fortune on psychologists and counselors. But if you can figure out, if, if, if you can be your, your child's counselor, if your child trusts you as their mentor for these things, it, it is really much more efficient and you will have the time. But you've got to let go of your presuppositions that you have to teach or be a professional in front of your child. Be a parent. Be, be, you know, you're not, you can't be, you know, you're their friend at some level, but you are their parent, you know, and it matters. And, you know, to show them that you care, that, that, that you, that you want to, that you've got their best interests in mind at all times is really important. And it's going to pay dividends down the line. So the time that you spend trying things and failing at them together, trying new things and finding what works, um, Getting in arguments and resolving them. That's important. My, my uh, colleague, Susanna Sheffer, wrote a book called A Sense of Self, Studying Homeschooled Adolescent Girls. And what she found is that adolescent girls who went to school, um, Susanna didn't find this out, Carol Gilligan and many other researchers did at the time. Uh, Mary P Pfeiffer, I think, is the, uh, another one. Uh, Revive, Reviving Ophelia, I think, was her, her book. About how teenage girls, studies show teenage girls, when they go into high school, deliberately dumb themselves down. So Susanna wanted to know if that happened with homeschool teenage girls. And she found it didn't. But um, what they did, of course, was have conflict with their parents. But they didn't want to not be with their parents. You know, I'm reminded of the uh, Peter Yusinov quote. He says that, you know, parents are the bones that our child's puppies chew on. And um, I think that's particularly true in the teenage years, you know. <laughs> uh, so... Putting up and working with your children through the teenage years is really key and really worth it. Will pay off for you, and is much better than just finding them the latest and greatest textbook, and then paying for them. And then you know, if they don't do well in the course or they blow the course off, you're still not going to know why. At least now, if you put the time in, you'll know why, and you'll know better than to to get involved in some sort of you know project like that with them. You know, so how do you help your child? You know. Well, you can, you can act as a volunteer. You can help them find an internship. Your children can volunteer alongside you, by the way. But as teenagers, it would be best if you can figure out things that they could do on their own. Uh, apprenticeships, doing community service, community activities, getting involved in stuff outside of the home and outside of the school is really important. If, if the school lets you participate in activities, great. But most high schools don't. You know, school sports and, and extracurriculars tend to be no-nos, which is why so many homeschooling groups start. And, and don't forget, you know, homeschooling co-ops. Um, finding part-time work, that was a big thing. My, our, our, my daughters all found work by the time they were 14. Getting their working papers and finding work was a big, a big motivation for them. Working in home businesses um, is, is great. Either starting a small home business if you're a stay-at-home parent and having children help, or just seeing them and just having your children see what a home business is as you do it. Is, is very valuable, like the family business idea. Oh, where'd that go? You know, so um, there, there are, you know, don't, don't forget that it's important to model the behavior that you want your children to have too. If you sit home all day and watch TV, is it any surprise that they do, you know? So get out and do stuff, Be, do stuff with them, you know, take them places so that they see you've got stuff to do, you know? Finding work worth doing and not just settling for the work that you get assigned from school is, is a real a real important thing to show our, our kids. All right? So now let's say you've got children that are doing, doing this stuff. Um, now how do you account for this for college? Well, here's the nitty-gritty. All right? Um, if you're going to apply to a college that wants – that will accept your transcripts. And most do, by the way. Most will accept the homeschool transcript. Um, but it should be, you know, properly formatted and, 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 and backed up. And here's how you back it up and do it. This is, um, I published a book called And What About College by Kathy Cohen. Um, and then it later got printed by Prima. Uh, as, uh, I forget, the college homeschooling book, something like that. Um, it's, that, by the way, is also on the handouts with the correct titles. But this is a page from the uh, uh, appendix where she describes like how she uh, and her daughter 
uh, Tamara kept track of, of what she was doing for college uh, records. So um, they followed uh, a curriculum for some things and other things they, they, they unschooled, if you will, although Kathy would say they were unschoolers. So I, I guess we would just say they did eclectic homeschooling. You know, they picked and choose. So, um, and here's, and, and it was Tamara's responsibility to keep track of what she did. So, um, here's like what Tamara's calendar would look like for Wednesday, April 3rd. She woke up, she read the newspaper, the morning news, and she discussed it. So she wrote one half SS. And then at the bottom, you could see she's broken it into, um, what they stand for. S is so SS is social studies. So they're counting a half hour of reading the morning news and talking to social studies. Then she read Anne of Green Gables for two hours. That counts as language arts. She read, uh, she did a, an hour of math. She played a geography game for an hour. That's social studies. She did sewing at her 4-H club for two hours. That's independent living skills. Um, biology. She did a half hour of biology in the textbook, I imagine. That was science. Then she did softball practice. That's two hours of physical ed. Then she took a voice lesson, did, no, did voice practice at home, a half hour, fine arts. Then she watched the movie Glory, it was on my mind. Uh, that was two hours, and that's social studies. So that's just in one day. Now, this shouldn't take more, according to Kathy, this shouldn't take more than five minutes a day to do. And, you know, doing it at the end of the day or simultaneously as you're doing it is fine. Um, and then um, at, at the end of each month, they would go through and collect all the hours. So she would like say, she would break out the LA, for instance, language arts. And then in that month, she, she noted that she did reading of these three books and that's in, in that total 10 hours. She watched Romeo and Juliet and that was for two hours. Then she wrote letters, correspondence, and she wrote an article for 4-H. So that all adds up. The reason the hours are important is because of the way Carnegie units are, are determined. Now, if all this seems overwhelming to you, if you're an unschooler, that's all right. I'm going to show you other ways of doing it. But this is, this is the, the gold standard, if you will, because if you were to run an alternative school or if you were to work in a school, this is pretty much how they're going to break it down. Of course, I won't count softball practice or 4-H sewing or reading the newspaper, but that's the beauty of homeschooling. It all counts. We run our schools. We determine what the learning is. So if I know that my daughter can intelligently talk about why the Supreme Court decision was important uh, today about um, allowing the uh, Affordable Care Act to continue, well, then that counts. And I'm going to count that. You know, I don't know how many kids in school will be able to do that, right? So this is the thing. Don't compare yourself. I mean, you want to sometimes just see where you're going, I guess. So, you know, I, I, I got over comparing myself to, and my family to other families. But I know that especially when you get started, you want to know. But, you know, th this is the conventional way of doing it in school. And a lot of homeschoolers uh, who want to get, particularly in Ivy League school, do it. Although I, I've got stories of unschoolers who got into Ivy League schools, too. So... You want to do this to show the credits and re and that you kept records so that, you know, it's it wasn't just a complete free form and now I'm going to try and get into, into school. Although that sometimes works, as I'll explain. So now that you've got all that, you know, oh, and then the other thing is, you, you know, before Kathy, when Kathy was writing the book, we didn't have the internet. So internet resources count, like online classes, of course. You can even use whole curriculums and submit that as your high school curriculum each year. Like that's your homeschool plan. If you want to do that, you know, um, that's, you know, then you're just more of an adjunct professor to the online school, but that's your business. I mean, you, you could do that. But if you're talking about making a, hand, a handmade education with your child together, um, you know, you could do this more uh, eclectic unschooling approach that I'm talking about. So here's Carnegie Credits. Carnegie units, you know, so basically um, they, they, They're often called Carnegie units. I, I've often referred to them as Carnegie credits But now the more modern day usage is units. So I'll correct that in the next slides But for now you add up all of that time, right? You know that, that you've collected way back here, you know when you've got Yeah, you know, you've got all your time here you take your monthly time add them all up and then you get you start to get your 
Carnegie. One Carnegie credit is 90 to 200 hours of seat time in one class. And that is literally seat time, folks. <laughs> That's what cracks me up about this. You could actually do 50 hours of, of work and complete the entire course if you're doing an online course or a correspondence course that came through the mail. But you will not get the credit until you've sat through the entire course. Seat time is important, unfortunately. It's the amount of time spent, not the quality of, of the effort. And you know, and this was devised in the 1920s, and it's got a funny history of why it's around, which I won't get into. It has very little to do with helping kids learn and everything to do with paying teachers. <laughs> so let me just say that. Um, but anyway, so so we have we, we have this, and then um, you know, in, in case you're wondering, because like, like like let's say you want to do a class um, like sewing, like uh, if you, your your son or daughter really got into it, was making costumes for plays, and you know, doing fashion design or making you know outfits for uh, military or space use, you know. You, if you want to give them credit, you want to come in between 120 to 180 hours on that, and then you can give them a credit. And just so you know, one semester usually equals just a half a Carnegie unit or credit. You know, it takes a full year. They, they devise it so uh, you get one Carnegie unit or one Carnegie credit per class per year. So that's how that's going to break down. Um, and, that's, and that's why you want to keep track of the hours. That's the most common way. However, you don't need to do seat time. There are other schools, and there are colleges like Hampshire College or Goddard or College of the Atlantic in Maine that will accept other types of credit granting criteria, such as subject or project completion. Um, you can CLEP. Um, that's a college-level examination program, I think it's called, where an uh, exit program where you take an exam in a subject like algebra or college level um, science, biology say, and um, if, if you get a certain score, they say that you, 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 you now have met the equivalent of what would be the 101 class, the intro class that, that they wanted you to take, that was a core requirement. So you know you can reduce the number of classes, core requirements and classes you have to take and pay for in college uh, by, by taking a club. Um, but you know, Another way to do it is to say that we have mastery discussion and other subjective measures to the granting criteria, and that you know you you, you have video of, of them defending a thesis, or you've got a, a, a paper that they wrote and defended, or you, you've got reviews of plays that they you know Shakespearean plays that they've starred in and done in or directed or created the sets for. I mean, there are other ways to prove that your kids can do it other than just sitting in a seat and counting the time that they've had someone talk at them. But the other thing is community college courses, too. And that is something that I can't emphasize enough. Um, a lot of homeschoolers, and this has been true for all three of my daughters, have taken community college courses at the high school level. You can take them as young as 14, and my daughters have taken everything from psychology to Japanese at our local community college and got a lot out of them. And those all count. When you apply to college and you have a certain number of community college courses with their grades and transcripts under your belt, maybe even a reference, a recommendation from a community college teacher, that helps you a lot. So don't neglect taking community college courses or extension courses. Harvard Extension uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, very popular courses with homeschoolers. You know, anything like that that, that that can prove that you can do college level work, that you know, that sends a signal that you will be able to accomplish this stuff. That's really what they're looking for. Um, and so you you can do this, you know. And so what are they looking for? Well, for instance, Williams College, uh, and by the way, you could this is the work you've got to do. You're the parent. You can do it alongside or acting as your child's college counselor. You can look this up and say, all right, here are colleges that sort of match what you're looking for. Um, but let's say your son or daughter wants to go, go to Williams College in Massachusetts, one of the most competitive colleges, or Texas University, which is highly competitive. Well, you want to find out what the requirements are. Yeah, and you should do this well before you apply, all right, because they're asking for like three to four years of a foreign language. You're not going to accomplish that your senior year of high school. So thinking ahead of time, 
Well, for instance, our daughter Audrey started studying Japanese when she was in uh, fourth grade. So, you know, she easily matched the foreign language requirements because she studied Japanese right through high school um, right until her freshman year of high school. And so because our, that's when she decided to go to school, by the way. And because she was in our local um, school, uh, they didn't teach Japanese in a local high school. And she couldn't take Japanese at um, the dual enrollment program because she was a freshman, even though when she was in eighth grade, she took Japanese at the local community college. And I believe she had a B minus C plus, which considering she was in eighth grader with community college, we were, we were thrilled taking Japanese. But anyway, the foreign language requirements, uh, fun ways to learn a language. Um, if you know, knowing that you might have a foreign language requirement, here's a couple of ways that I've heard from homeschoolers over the years. One way is um, to invite uh, foreign uh, uh, foreign students to live with you. You know, either during the school year as homeschoolers, it's it's easy to do, uh, or over the holidays in summer, and then just ask them as much as possible to speak their language with your children, and um, you know, in exchange for them learning English. You know, uh, I I know one mom who hired um, a a maid who spoke who spoke Spanish and English. But she asked, he asked her to only speak Spanish to her children. And she explained to her children that, that that's how they would learn Spanish. So, you know, they would turn Sesame Street on in Spanish and watch it while the maid was working and they'd be talking and stuff. And they picked up, a, they picked up enough Spanish to, to be conversant in it that way. You know, um, another thing some parents are worried, oh, my kids are athletic. They're not going to get in. You know, I, they, they can't be homeschooled because, you know, they're going to miss out on a sports scholarship. Sports scholarships are way overrated. They're not as big as and pop and, 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 and generous as people think. But you can get into college sports by participating in the American Athletic Union. Uh, look that up. Um, it, it's they have all sorts of sports: soccer, football, basketball, and college and professional sports um, talent scouts go to American Athletic events and, and look for them. So that's another way that that you could do this. So um, now that you know the requirements, like, you know, Williams College wants four years of English. Then you go back. Do I have four years? What have I done? Well, go back and you check through your book uh, if, if you're keeping the, the book by the hour. If you're doing it by completion, look through the, your records. What have I completed? Sit down with your sons and daughters and talk about what they've done over there. What books have you read? What math have you done? Let's, and draw it all up and then say, okay, here's our baseline. Now, going forward, you know, we need to take you know, more math. Um, and, and note that, like, you know, they want two years of a foreign language at Trinity, but three to four at Williams. Um, and then math, they only want three years of math at, at Trinity, but four years of math um, going into Williams. So it's important to look at these things because not all colleges are the same, although you would think they are because of the SAT and all this idea that everyone has to test the same and, and be judged the same. And there's a lot of colleges that are friendly to unschoolers and homeschoolers, uh, unschoolers in particular, because they understand, you know, that you can create your own curriculum. And in Hampshire College, that's exactly what you get to do. Um, Bard College is another one that operates in a, similarly. Um, and then there's uh, colleges like Shimer University, uh, Shy I think it's Shimer um, in Illinois, uh, that, that are actually – looking, they recruit homeschoolers, and then there's Patrick Henry University or Patrick Henry College in Virginia that was started specifically for homeschoolers. Um, and, but staying out of uh, the private schools, although you can get financial aid in the private schools, but just as, a, a, as regular uh, high school students can apply for financial aid to go to college, so do homeschoolers. Um, you apply uh, here in Massachusetts, we have the New England Board of Higher Education, MIFA, Massachusetts Education um, Funding Association, I think something like that. And, um, you know, so you get financial aid through them and through FAFSA, you know, which everyone uh, fills out. I've got more information on the handout about this. You will not be denied financial aid. You, you may not qualify for some financial aid because you were in part and parcel of certain programs and schools that give out the, the funds, but you will be able to get it. Um, and just, just so you know, um, what happened with my oldest daughter, um, she homeschooled through high school, uh, unschooled. She was taking all sorts of odd courses, uh, but she loved community college and she had so many community college credits that when she was 18, 
um, rather than graduate from high school, we decided she would just take a few more courses and then she got her BA degree from the local community college when she was 19. And by getting that, um, uh, the uh, two year degree, now it's not a BA degree, um, by getting the two year uh, community college degree, she, uh, Massachusetts has a, a rule that you can matriculate to any state college um, if you have a certain GPA. And my daughter not only had a high GPA, a high enough GPA, she qualified for a scholarship for the, it's called the Abigail uh, Adams Scholarship. She got to UMass Amherst. Um, and so she, she was able to do all that by not going to high school, working uh, through community college and independent study and doing part-time work. Um, and she was able to also get uh, financial aid from MIFA and through FAFSA. Um, and just so you know, she just finished her master's in social work at the University of uh, San Diego, uh, San Diego, USC, and uh, is now working as a social worker. So, um, you know, homeschoolers aren't all destined to just, you know, collect welfare as uh, our educationists would have it. Now, You may wonder, if I'm unschooling my son or daughter, you know, how, you know, it's easy to see in uh, elementary school how playing with Legos might turn into engineering. But what about if they are in high school? It still applies. Everything's a learning opportunity. Um, this is, oh, that's the name of the book, Homeschoolers College Admissions Handbook by Kathy Cohen. Um, she had this, these two pages in there about speaking education ease. When I do my learning without curriculum workshops, I often spend uh, a lot of time about education ease and how to turn plain, you know, the plain learning your children are doing into the education ease jargon. And Kathy, I think, thought did a great job here. Um, for instance, if your kids like to play chess, you call that critical thinking. If they like paintball, it's phys ed. Sim City uh, that no longer exists. That was a popular game. Now I guess we'd say it's Minecraft, social studies, math, and critical thinking. Um, gardening is science and physical ed. Home renovation projects are math, science, woodwork. And of course, if you can detail that, make a few notes. Like if, if they actually help build um, a shed or something, you could say like you know, they they worked on the blueprints or they corrected the blueprints or they you know they calculated you know the, the pressure needed to get the water through the hose so that the pump would work i mean you know just little things like that all matter you know um in the world of special education they call them embedded learning opportunities elo guess what embedded learning opportunities exist throughout our lives and everything we do and the, the, this page and this page give you some great examples of, of how to pull that out um, if you attend a concert, you're participating in fine arts. If you're doing a performance, it's fine arts. Um, if you're going to a church youth group, you're participating, you're, you're practicing language arts, religion, social studies, 4-H and scouts, social studies. It can be science, language arts, math, all depends on what you're doing. Model rocketry, of course, is science and physics. Why wouldn't it be? Well, in school, of course, it's not, unless a teacher does it with you. If you do it yourself, it's not, but if you do it, you know, it's, it's just... And this is the beauty of homeschooling. You know, you're the teacher, so it counts. You know, if your child loves to read nonfiction, you know, biographies of famous, you know, uh, writers or scientists or mathematicians, fantastic. If they're if they're intrapersonal learners, if they you know interpersonal learners where, where they have to talk and stuff, newspapers, current events, social studies, you know, these are all things that that, that you could be used to our advantage that we don't have to quell. And subdue, you know, like they do in school, so that everybody else in the class can get on and, and with the teacher's lecture. Instead, like we can encourage these things and, and build on, on our child's interest in social media, in current events. You know, these are all things that, that we play to our advantage. So, if you feel that 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 your child is doing nothing, or or you're worried that unschooling isn't working, think about education ease and think about how. So many of the things that, that we do throughout our lives normally get turned into school subjects. You can do that too. You know, um, do we, I, I don't want to belabor the point because there's a lot more to say, but um, I, you know, in, in my book, Teach Your Own, I talk a, a, a bit about this too. Um, and and I, I'm, I have a, a whole workshop called Learning Without a Curriculum where I talk about this. So I hope to put that up someday. Um, 
this is from a book that I really recommend you get if you're thinking of going to college or if you just want to create a really good portfolio if, if you really like you know some people I know really like I, I mean we just wanted to, to give them the bare bones minimum and get on with our lives and have as little to do with, with the school evaluation process as possible but some parents really find it good to like pull stuff together at the end of the year or throughout the year at different times and, and organize and um, and, and I, I certainly am, am, am in favor of organizing things. I, I just don't don't come to the daily level of organization when it comes to keeping track of what my children have learned. But um, when it comes time to apply to college, this book by Loretta Ewer, The Homeschooler's Guide to Portfolios and Transcripts, can't be beat. And this one section that I, I pulled out of that book, the rubric one, is really important because I showed you earlier what Williams and Texas University um, expect from incoming freshmen, you know. And so you got to help your, your child match up to the school, but also is the school a good match for your child? So, you know, as you're preparing your, your, your materials to apply to college, do I have breadth and depth? Do I have achievements that I could show that my child has done? And then some expertise, some, some depth. Um, what impressed the admissions officials um, at, at Harvard University um, when my uh, friend uh, Maureen Carey's daughter Aiden applied um, was that she had been involved in community theater in so many different ways. She had um, quite quite um, expertise in, in theater, but also she was also involved um, in her church. She was involved in a lot of social activities, um, uh, social justice activities, I should say. And um, she was just really uh, an activist. And so those things played in her favor uh, very strongly. She wound up getting a scholarship to Harvard. Um, and again, here's a homeschooler, homeschooled all through her life. And um, last I heard, she was working, she worked in the KIPP schools in uh, Manhattan and is now on a scholarship to Great Britain in education, uh, doing something in the field of education. So the idea that people who are homeschooled or unschooled have no interest in education is also another great lie that I've always known. But, you know, you know educators just don't like that, that there, are, there are other ways of doing it, I guess. And... You know, the personal traits to emphasize when you're applying to um, colleges would be leadership, maturity, curiosity, resourcefulness, um, uniqueness and individuality, community involvement, all right? So those are all things that, you know, that you should think about, all right, do I have clear and credible material that shows these aspects of my child? And then what, what, what do I think the school is looking for? Because, like, you can look through their materials. You can look through their alumni newsletters. What does the school seem to value? And then plug into that. It's just like job hunting, in a, in a sense, you know. Um, and so the last two questions Loretta has: Have I demonstrated how the school and I are a good match? And have I shown that I am a, a homeschooler who can do these things? So I find that this is a much easier way to view the college application process than you know just thinking about GPAs and SATs, you know. Knowledge is connected in the world, but it's divided in school. Let me give you this story. Um, Eric Demain, the, this young man here, he's now a professor at MIT. Um, he uh, was at 20 uh, when, in 2002 when uh, he l arrived in MIT uh, with the rank of assistant professor, one of the youngest the university has ever hired. Um, however, as the article says, Raised among hippies and jugglers and free thinkers, Eric Demain has found himself at the center of a field where abstract math somehow intersects with street performance. This is because he was raised by his, his dad, and his dad was a, a juggler and um, a silversmith and a glass blower, and he was peripatetic and took them all around the, the, the world Halifax, Nova Scotia, Miami Beach. He was always on the road. And um, Eric, while his dad was earning money and doing these things and uh, being homeschooled, uh, unschooled and whatever you want to call it, just living and learning with his dad, developed an interest in origami. And he became so good at origami, um, and his dad and he started to explore the mathematical connections of origami, that when they would travel to different uh, cities for his dad's work, 
they would then look up professors at local colleges and you know who might be able to help Eric answer certain questions he was posing about <laughs> origami folding and make a long story short what what made Eric famous was NASA was having a lot of trouble getting one of these gigantic solar panels to unfold out of a uh, satellite and Eric came up with a solution I forget how young he was but he was young and that got, got him the attention of MIT, and I believe he's still teaching at MIT right now. So um, it just goes to show, you know, relationships and building up a skill and an expertise in something is far more important than just having, like, marching through the general courses that everyone else does and then forgetting them as soon as the test is done, you know? This is real information, and, you know, this is information that he, got, he gathered in a holistic way, not sitting down every day for an hour studying origami or math. I mean, it happened, you know, in, in fits and starts and, and probably often in, in big gulps too, you know, but uh, it's perfectly possible. And then the story of the eight year study, you know, I, I, I mentioned this because this came out in the late thirties. This, they wanted to find out if kids didn't go to conventional high schools, would they do well in college? This was in the 1930s. They got 22 high schools. Each one was different. Some were conventional, some were what they called experimental, what we now call alternative. Others were Christian independent schools. Others were other types of religious schools. 22 wildly different curricula. And then they, they got the colleges to agree to the experiment where they would take four years, the kids who spent four years in any one of those 22 high schools, they would immediately be, they would be accepted for four years in any one of these colleges that they applied to. And then they would be able to see how they did in college, you know, and compare all these 22. And what they found out was the more freedom the child had, the more alternative, the less school-like the school experience was for the high school student, the better they did in college and the more extracurricular activities they did in college. And that was in the 1930s. But then World War II came, and we, we forgot about the eight-year study. But it's there. I urge you to look it up and, and, and check it out. And that, and that was to try and revise high school in the 30s. Obviously, that went nowhere. And then in the 80s, 90s, in, in the aughts, we have Leon Botstein uh, writing Jefferson's Children, saying, we need to change high school. Horace's Compromise, Theo Sizer, Ted Sizer. He says we have to change high school. People have been saying we have to change high school forever. The 1930s, the eight-year study, it hasn't happened. You can. You can. You can save your child from four years of drudgery. If that's it, if your kid likes high school, if it's working, no problem. If you're happy with it and your child's happy, no problem. Stay with it. But we know that's not true for everybody, and there are other options. And as Botstein and Sizer and other authors indicate, we do need something more and better. But we're having a damn hard time trying to figure that out unless you're homeschooling. Hey, Pat, I just yeah. wanted to pop in for a moment. You've got yeah. about uh, six minutes left before four o'clock. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks. No problem. You're, you're on a roll. Okay. Yep. And I'm nearing the end here. So um, I really recommend, in addition to those, uh, to, to the books that uh, I said earlier about um, by Loretta Ewer, uh, Portfolios and Transcripts and, and What About College by Kathy Cohen, and college admissions handbook um, these books this book here self-directed learning documentation stories just came out uh, by West Beach highly recommended um, some of them are, are, are classic unschooling stories and, and you know how he documents them and presents their trans their, their unconventional high school transcripts for college very useful very useful information Blake Bowles book college without high school same thing DIYU by Anya Kamenetz, excellent book about uh, the changing face of higher education and why you, you should consider maybe not doing a four-year college right now. Same thing with Success Without College by Linda Lee. And there's, a, there's been a lot of books. I mean, at Holt Associates, we're selling them in the 1980s. The Question is College by Herb Cole was, was, is an excellent book. I think it's out of print. That came out in 1988. I mean, people think it's only because college has gotten so expensive. But people forget that it's the expense that's now driving the movement. But before that, it was the quality. We were all questioning four years of college. What is what is its signal? You get a degree just by by getting through. You don't get it, you know. And then we all wind up with a college degree. That's all that the 
that's all that seems to matter. You know, Joe Blow, who spent all year, all four years partying at the frat, gets the same college degree as me. You know, and I may have spent all my time studying and working part time. Right? The employer. I mean, it's a very bad signal, <laughs> and and I hope that you know documentation and life stories that West Beach has put out and and other types of transcripts and and stories and ways of proving of signaling to work and employers that and, and educators that we can do the work that they want us to do that we're capable of it that these become the signals rather than four years of a hundred thousand dollars of school this again this is 1995 we're questioning college then but this woman and this is from women's day has a wonderful approach to it what she and her husband decided was you know they didn't think college was worth it for their kids because they you know things were changing so much even in the mid 90s but what they said was we'll pay for you to go to a trade school so each one of their kids went to a trade school one became a plumber one became an electrician and one of them decided to go back uh, and, and get their college degree later but you know what they pointed out that the the one that stayed in the trade school made a hundred thousand dollars but their you know last year and the one who's their college educated daughter who works five dollars an hour in an administrative job $5 an hour in 1995. I guess that'd be $7 now, right? But, <laughs> but that's an interesting approach to it. Go to trade school first and then go to college. I mean, this whole idea that we need four years of college, I mean, we should be able to go through it as quickly as possible, you know, it's, it, I think. But that's yet another discussion, another story. And then here, Forbes magazine. Everyone says you got to go to college to make more money. But, you know, Forbes shows that people who don't go to college and are Forbes 400 members, make far more money than those who go to college. I mean, the whole idea that you got to go to college to make more money is, is flawed in, in, in many ways because they're not even using current day numbers. You know, they're using numbers from the 1990s, you know, to, you know, in terms of what, what we're getting for salaries and stuff. It's very dicey right now, very dicey. And in fact, if you're in the field of computers, I recommend going to a hacker school where, you know, you'll come out and, and, and you know, they'll get you a job rather than going to a four-year school. I mean, this is what's happening, where it's getting to the point where um, we everyone's gonna have a degree. I remember when I was in high school and I didn't wanna go to college, I wanted to be a pianist, and everyone kept saying, oh, you gotta go to college, because a, co a college degree now is worth what a high school degree is. They were telling me that in the 70s. And this, this cartoon, I don't know when it came out, oh, 2003, I see. This was 2003. Well, here it is two, 12 years later. And it's even worse. We're, you know, we have more, more people with degrees right now than ever. And what's happening? Not many jobs are there. <laughs> this is my friend I was telling you about, Aiden. Um, that, you know, Aiden Carey here and her mom, Maureen. This is the girl that uh, got into Harvard uh, with all her community, um, co uh, community theater efforts and without a, high, a traditional high school diploma. You know, and finally, uh, the Colfaxes. You know, I can't emphasize enough. Um, when when Grant got into college, it was so unusual. He was on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and the 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 uh, National Enquirer ran a headline: "Goat Boy Gets Into College." You could see they raised dairy goats on their farm. Um, now it's not unusual at all for people to get into college, and there were, it's no longer shocking. You're not going to find any homeschooler who gets into college be, being newsworthy these days. So. Be bold, don't be scared. Your kids will do well if you homeschool and unschool them through high school. And in fact, I recommend, you know, places like UnCollege and many different opportunities that I didn't even get a chance to get into. Meyer Frost and uh, the, the New Global Student, all those books are on my handout. I really recommend that, that you consider other options besides going to college, but I know college is important to a lot of people. You can get into it without difficulty. Thank you, and I, I look forward to any questions you may have uh, via Facebook, or you can private message me too. Thanks so much. Thank you, Pat. That was wonderful.